Draco Malfoy and the Mortifying Ordeal of Being in Love by Is This Self-Care? Narrated by S.E.P. Chapter 32. A Pedagogical Exchange. At the manor, a briskly snapping fire awaited them in the smallest salon. The curtains had been drawn against the darkening sky. Henriette laid out a small gorture of cheese squares, tamponade, and tiny quiche Lorraine. They divested themselves of their winter things. Draco installed himself in an armchair in shirt sleeves and braces. Granger flung herself onto one of the sofas, folded her hands upon her chest, and smiled at the ceiling. Her elation was catching. Draco, too, felt a deep gladness, for the wizarding world at large, but also for her, for having achieved something so meaningful after so much effort. The months had been long, the dangers had been many, the occasions for giving up innumerable. And she hadn't given up. She pushed through, and she had gone forth and conquered. He brimmed with admiration. To communicate this powerful emotion, Draco floated a cube of cheese over Granger's face. Can I help you? asked Granger to the cheese. You haven't eaten. Henriette will be vexed. Now he tried to float the cheese into her mouth. It bumped her nose and her chin. Granger swatted away the cheese. Drago wished to indicate that he was better at aiming for mouths with other things. Granger sat up and summoned a few crackers towards herself. It was the first time they'd eaten together in a long time. Drago watched her partake in one of the quiche Lorraines in small bites. What? asked Granger. You eat like a pygmy puff. Granger looked provoked. Then she sniffed. I should like to compare you to some creature or other, but I must be fair. Poor table manners don't number amongst your many flaws. Draco was simultaneously flattered and offended. My many flaws. Now Granger looked prim. What did I do? asked Draco. What didn't I do? Just another broken promise, said Granger, lightly as one would, if one's trust in men had been obliterated, yet again, by Draco Malfoy. Oh, are we doing this again? Yes. Which promise? You never taught me the Calais Presidium. Draco was piqued. You never taught me the things you were meant to, either. Granger was holding back a smile. I suppose we've both been a bit busy. A bit. Are you busy tonight? asked Granger. You're meant to be doing nothing. I know. Learning my most complex ward is not nothing. Permit me this extravagant. Fine, but you're going to teach me the rune at command. Granger hopped to her feet and looked eager. All right. She had managed to do nothing for all of ten minutes. Let's go to my study, said Draco. I shall have to draw some things out. It gets a bit theoretical. Ooh, said Granger, following him out of the salon. I like theory. Granger opened the door to his study and stepped aside to let her in. She looked about, taking in the furnishings, the heavy curtains, the candles floating in glowing clusters. The fire sputtered and purred. One wall was dominated by a painting of some of his grandfather's prized Abraxans. The winged horse's ears pricked at the sight of Granger. One gave her a curious little wicker. Draco sat himself behind his desk. He had expected that Granger would take one of the two seats for guests across from it. However, when she saw him drawing parchment and an ink pot towards himself, she joined him on his side of the desk and perched herself upon one of his chair's wide armrests. Draco did not mind this invasion of personal space in the least. It felt wonderful to have her back. So, Calais Presidium. Draco inked his quill and drew out a few lines. I suppose you know what a geodesic polyhedron is. I do. Some viruses have capsids shaped like geodesic polyhedra, actually. Capsids? A sort of shell made of protein. Granger waved her hand at him. Continue. Right. My intent with this ward was to distribute any incoming magical forces throughout the structure. Most traditional wards have a point of weakness that can be brute forced through concussive or compressive magics especially the parabolic wards that we typically see used over dwellings. No ward is unbreakable, of course, but Calais Presidium requires far more magical pressure over a longer period to crack. Draco drew a few more polyhedra. In essence, the more vertices cross the sphere, like this, the stronger it is. After you've established the ward's desired scale and strength, you need a bit of arithmancy to divide its face and calculate its potency. So in this dodecahedron, for example, he sketched it out, I could divide these pentagons up into triangles, and from there into even smaller triangles. This gives us great many more vertices. That's called augmentation. He looked up to see if he had lost his audience yet. But no, Granger, her hands folded upon her lap, was the very picture of rapt attention. He could still smell winter on his own clothes, but she smelled of the fire from the salon. 
Now for the arithmetic. This formula, he wrote it out, gives us the number of vertices the polyhedron will have and its potential magical force. Of course, the more complex it is, the more exhausting to cast, but the longer it will last. Ooh, said Granger, eyeing the formula. That's multiplex arithmetic. I haven't done that since uni. Can I have a go? Draco jotted out an example for her to work on and passed her the quill. She leaned upon an elbow. There was a quiet delight in her as she worked, in the press of the quill on the parchment, in the thinking. She solved it in half a minute, which was, frankly, fucking sexy. A little tingle of pleasure cursed through Draco. He produced a more challenging example and gave her the quill again. He sat back to observe her. She brushed the tip of the feather against her lip as she pondered the new problem. Over his many years as an eligible bachelor and general libertine, Draco had been on the receiving end of a great many seduction tactics. Granger's inattentive lip brushing ranked amongst the most tantalizing. After a longer bit of working out, she solved the second example, too. Draco was titillated. He wished that she would slide off the armrest and fall into his lap. That would be the pinnacle of whatever this was. This sapiophile's wet dream. Granger in his lap, solving obscure bits of arithmetic exponentiation. His next challenge was unfair. Granger attempted it, stopped in confusion, then gave him an accusatory look before breaking the arithmetic down in reverse. Your starting point was pentagons. This one has square facets. Well spotted, smirked Draco. He held his hand out for her to return the quill. What happens if we augment it? asked Granger, withholding the quill. We would render the fabric of the universe, I expect. Well, let's see. She worked through the calculation. Oh, a geodesic subdivision resulting in right-angle triangles, not equilateral ones. Not as strong, I suppose. Draco looked at Granger's interesting creation. That would be my assumption, too. There's a beauty in it, isn't there? There is, said Draco, not talking about geometry, obviously. Are you game for one more? Granger looked suspicious. All right. No tricks this time, I promise. Only complexities. He produced a final example, a rather nasty one, to ensure that she would be occupied for longer than a moment, so that he could indulge in this experience, in the push of her hip against his arm, in the brush of her heel against his shin. Hmm, said Granger. We need to use Kohler's law. You know Kohler's? I do. My word, this has become stimulating. Granger pressed her lips together. Whether I can remember it all, however. She planted two elbows on the desk and muttered vague recollections of Kohler's. Yes, stimulating. His cock twist out a hello against his inner thigh. Granger had taken off her bulky jumper and was wearing a thin muggle top. Draco stared at the flare of her hips. Very holdable, you know, very nicely shaped for a man's hands, if a man were having filthy thoughts while a woman calculated primary vertices. He decided to avert his eyes before he developed a full-on erection. The window across from his desk provided unhelpful distraction. It was dark outside, and all he could see was a reflection of the candlelit study. Granger was leaning over, providing a lovely view of cleavage and the top edge of her bra. Brilliant. Should he just have a wank over his principal right here? She was distracted, and it would probably take him a minute. Gods. Granger made some breakthrough or other and began to scribble away. Done, she said, and flung down the quill. Draco leaned forward to study the parchment and her elegant solution. Yes, she had done it. And it was fucking erotic. The ink pot on his desk exploded. Granger jumped. What the? An uncontrolled magical spurt. Wonderful. A step above coming in his pants. Sorry said Draco, banishing away the evidence of his premature ink ejaculation. Are you all right? I was overstimulated. Overstimulated, repeated Granger, looking far more mystified than she had any point during his explanation. Draco cleared his throat. Shall we carry on? You'll be doing these calcs in your head after the first few times. The wand movement is similar to salviohexia, only we want the upwards cuts to equal C3, which can take a long time, as you might imagine. The casting intent isn't protection, it's fortification. Do take note of that. The nuance matters. The incantation is Calais Presidium. Once. At the beginning. That's all. Right, said Granger. Let me give it a go. Ward the door. Draco took advantage of her shifted attention to pull out a trouser leg, discreetly so that the bulge looked like an innocuous fold in the material. More or less. Granger cast the spell a few times, interspersed with a few more scribbles of arithmetic. Her casting was slow, and her ward was small, 
but it was clear that she had understood the gist of it. On her fifth attempt, a fairly credible silvery net splayed itself across the door, shimmered, and disappeared. Well done, said Draco, instead of, I am wildly turned on at the moment. I shall have to practice. What an interesting ward. I've not seen arithmancy applied to spell work this way, I don't think. It's useful. I've tried to teach it to other ors, but most of them don't have any interest as soon as they see the arithmetic notations. Granger tutted, their loss. She made as though to get up, but Draco touched his fingers to her arm. What? Our quid pro quo, Professor, the runic command. Right, Granger shifted in her seat to face him. One of her legs was tucked under her where she perched on the armrest. The other rested slightly between his. Very good. Granger held up her wand and drew out four golden runes. The candles went out and the fire in the hearth reduced to a glow of embers. Oops, said Granger in her sudden darkness. She waved her wand and the candles lit themselves again. It's an apotrochaic syntax. The runes are from the Megan Runar syllabary, but I interpolated prosodics from the runital. It translates, broadly, to extinguish. Try the incantation first. The annotation is a bit tricky. Draco tried. Granger shook her head and repeated the ancient syllables slowly. He tried again. Granger tutted. You're tripping up on the palliative ejectives. The what? Stop sounding so posh. You're speaking ancient runic, not ordering foie gras at the Seneca. Draco tried again, infusing a bit of Nordic harshness to his speech. Better. If only you spoke German instead of the French. Granger sighed and looked wistful. Their fricatives are to die for. Now the runes. Granger plucked up the quill and dipped it into the fragmented remains of the ink pot. She drew four runes on the parchment. Draco copied them. The focus was good for him. He was apparently unable to concentrate on runes and sustain an erection at the same time. Granger took a vast, teasing pleasure in critiquing his calligraphy. Oh no. You've made la goose too squishy. Straighten that up. Good. A bit more confidence in the downward stroke. Right. Try again. What's happening over here? The roof collapsed over her favor? How does one draw such a perfect polyhedra and then do that to a rune? It's got four lines. As for this exhibit, is it a cheesy what's it? And what is that? Another one of your hedgehogs. And this? A spot of hyperbolic geometry. You're going to rend the fabric of the universe at this rate. Draco did not rend the fabric of the universe, but he did laugh too hard and poke a hole through the parchment. Granger studied it with a held-back smile, but offered no censure. Runes are meant to be carved, after all. After a few more practice runs, Granger pronounced herself pleased. They progressed to the wand movements. To prevent any universe rendering or other botheration, Granger put her hand over his as he drew out the runes into the air. Her hand was gentle over his, her palm soft over his knuckles. Draco's first few attempts paired with his horrid pronunciation were botched aberrations. Then Granger spoke the runic command with him, and that, along with her guided hand, resulted in the glow of golden runes, suspended, only for a moment, in the air. The candles flickered. Granger removed her hand from his so that he could crack on by himself. Draco pondered whether he ought to feign incompetence, but he also did not wish to look stupid in front of her. A dilemma for the ages. Pride won out. He tried again, and the runes glowed for a longer moment, and half the candles in the study were extinguished. The fire, however, crackled on merrily. Impertinent thing. That was a very fair attempt, said Granger. Well done. She was looking at him with a mixture of satisfaction and admiration, which pleased Draco very much, and sent lovely little flutterings to both his ego and his groin. Granger, sadly, decided to end her perching upon his chair. She rose with a groan and pressed a hand to her arse. My bum's gone numb. Shall I massage it? said Draco. That is quite all right, said Granger with a laugh. He hadn't been joking, but fine. Granger stretched, yawned, and eyed the door. Draco was not ready to let her go yet. He felt as though he had only just got her back. Are you off to do nothing? Granger observed him with a raised eyebrow. You look as though you've a compelling alternative in mind. I've thought of a new bargaining chip. For the computer. But it can wait. Now you've intrigued me. Have I? Oh, no. What is it? Come with me. They left the study. Granger fell into step beside Draco, with a few extra hops forward here and there, given the relative lengths of their strides. Where are we going? First, it was meant to be a birthday present, as I didn't know what to get you, because you're a mogul and you can buy yourself anything you like. And I hadn't any ideas besides appalling pajamas or other less appropriate... Mm, anyway, Mabon came and went, and I lost the moment. 
Then I wanted to use it to cheer you up when Greyback put his vile posters all over London, but you were consumed by your work and hardly had time to sleep. They arrived at a set of double doors. Now, since I've missed all of my windows of opportunity, I've decided that I might as well be a proper scoundrel about it and use it as leverage for the computer. Draco breathed out a soft, oh, when she recognized the doors. She turned to Draco, the beginnings of a smile upon her lips. Strategic. I approve. Wand, said Draco, holding out his hand. Granger placed it in his palm. Draco held it to the doors and, with a few waves of his own wand, added Granger to a very short list of individuals permitted to enter the Malfoy Library. He pushed open one of the doors. Granger took an excited step forwards, but found the way barred by his arm. She looked up at him. Yes? The computer. I will be your personal tutor until you've learned everything your little black heart desires. Draco smirked. They shook hands, and to his delight, Granger did not let go afterwards. She pulled him into the library behind her and drew him along as she discovered the place. It was gratifying to be with her as she explored the library, which took up an entire wing of the manor. It was part enormous reading room, part traditional stacks, part personal museum. Tall windows gave out onto the forest and the lake along the estate's western edge. A fire crackled. Reading desks and oversized armchairs were placed in thoughtful arrangements here and there, lit by magical lanterns. Granger's gasp continued to be an enormous source of pleasure. She requested a tour. Draco provided. They wandered through the stacks and display cases. Granger queried Draco upon the classification system, on the Malfoy's acquisition philosophy, on their weeding plan. There was a soft light in her eyes. Draco was expounding, very interestingly and intelligently, he thought, on the principles that guided his acquisitions in weeding, when he noticed that her gaze was unfocused. Are you still with me? asked Draco. Yes, said Granger, blinking. Draco continued. She drifted off again. Hello, said Draco, vexed. Sorry, yes, I'm here. Draco decided to reschedule the lecture, as he was clearly not as fascinating as he thought he was. Granger had a vague smile on her face. They walked past books and tomes and periodicals and a small collection of prints and drawings. He showed her the cartography collection. A scrawled Here There Be Monsters was inscribed upon a 17th century map. Draco pointed at a tiny speck amongst sea monsters and said that it was Granger. They passed through the rare books collection, displayed under glass. Granger sighed as she observed the ancient grimoires and manuscripts there. Who decided to put the Book of Din Eden under nonfiction? she gasped, coming to a sudden halt as she passed a shelf. Me, said Draco. Tsk, said Granger. The battle happened. That is open to interpretation, said Granger, with no small degree of swat. That bard's very existence is unsubstantiated. You'd be better off putting it under poetry, I think. Kind of you to share your opinion, but this is library et c'est moi, said Draco. Granger looked to be fomenting thoughts on revolution. They finished their tour. Granger found the sofa nearest the fire and curled up on it, and looked at the library as one might admire a prospective view over a beautiful landscape. This may be my favorite spot in the entire estate. Maybe. What others would you compete for your affections? Granger enumerated upon her fingers. I like the small salon near the back of the house, the one we were in today. It was ever so cozy when Henriette had the fire going. The terrace where we ate over the summer, that was just lovely. The rose garden is an absolute dream, of course. She trailed off as Draco seated himself next to her. What about a certain window ledge? asked Draco. It took her a moment, but Granger gathered his meaning and went pink across the cheeks. I'm not sure I remember that one. No? No. Right, I think you were dreaming. A rather tense silence descended upon the library. Granger was the first to crack. She leapt to her feet. Shall I teach you the computer? I'll go fetch it. But we had just got around to doing nothing, said Draco. Granger looked as though she had decided that doing nothing was a hazardous pursuit. We may as well, you know. It's essentially nothing. For me, anyway. It's very easy. She did not wait for his acquiescence and disappeared to fetch the device. She returned with the computer in her arms and a stack of her pucks. You look excited, she said as she sat herself next to him. I have been pondering this item's mysteries for ages. You could have asked any muggle-born, you know. No, I wanted you. Granger gave him an interrogative look as she pushed out a few of the buttons on the machine. It was lovely to learn the computer because Granger slid herself closer to him until their legs touched and balanced the device between them and she put on her hand over his to demonstrate how the touchpad worked. 
All very nice. She showed him the computer's functions, to write, to research, to communicate with others, to browse the internet. The internet was a thing that Draco was not quite certain he understood, but Granger could write things like cat or house or oncology into a box and information about the things came up, and pictures too. It seemed extraordinarily useful. An instant encyclopedia. Granger said that the entire contents of libraries were on it. She pushed the computer to him so that he could try the internet. But the first thing he searched for, with much belabored typing, was tits. Granger shrieked out a giggle as she watched the word appear. Malfoy! Draco gave a low whistle as he observed the results of his endeavor. Now tell me what the cloud is, and hackers, said Draco, passing the computer back to her, with five rather nice pairs of tits upon the screen. Granger got rid of the tits, a pity, and explained the cloud and hackers. The cloud was interesting, conceptually. The hacker's lack of axes or other violent weaponry disappointed him. Granger confirmed that there were usually no bloodshed involved, anticlimactic overall. When Draco had finished poking about on the computer, Bums and Draco completed his tour of the internet, he passed it back to Granger, who rose and began to put the things away. That was informative, said Draco. Now I know all your secrets. Hmm, I may have overplayed my hand. I don't know all of yours. Oh? Granger moved towards the door. But this has been an illuminating evening, regardless. Thank you for giving me access to the library. It's... Draco had risen too, and blocked her before she could reach the door handle. Which secret of mine is intriguing you? Granger shook her head. It's stupid. I won't tell you. Well, now I need to know. You don't need to know, said Granger, stepping away from him. There was a smile making its way upon her face. I do. You live in my house. You've seen me stark bollock naked. You have literally been me. What mystery persists? Granger laughed. A minor one. She took another step away. It's silly. He followed her into the stacks that she was backing into. Tell me. No. I shall back you into a corner and hex it out of you, said Draco. He made good on the first part of the threat. After a few more steps backward, Granger was cornered. She gasped in faux outrage. You wouldn't dare. The little chase into the stacks filled him with an unexpected rush of endorphins. His breathing picked up. I would, said Draco. He came closer. I'd teach you what a real ruptured bollock feels like, said Granger. You can do whatever you like with my bollocks. He took another step towards her. Don't make promises you can't keep, said Granger. She was against the stacks now and had nowhere to go. He smelled fire. He looked down at her. She looked up at him. He felt that much of his future happiness lay in those bright eyes. What secret? He prompted again, because if he didn't occupy his mouth with queries, it might do something idiotic, such as declare undying devotion to her. She looked off to the side as though calculating an escape route. Draco threw an arm up to bar the way. She looked to the other side. Draco put a single finger under her chin and turned her back towards him. You're terribly insistent, said Granger. I get what I want, said Draco. Granger gave him a magnificent eye roll. Then, relenting at last, she relaxed against the shells and beckoned him closer. He crowded in with delight. A bit of her hair caught in his end-of-the-day stubble as he leaned in. The wicked cream, whispered Granger into his ear. Ah, said Draco. It was his turn to grin. More than grin. He leaned his forehead into her shoulder and laughed. I await your answer said Granger, her breath brushing at the side of his neck. Draco lifted his head and said, I think it would require a practical demonstration. Demonstration is one of the more effective pedagogical methods, nodded Granger. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be gentlemanly, or appropriate, or wise. Granger looked unsurprised. What a pity. The tragedy of it rends my very being, said Draco, hardly exaggerating. Granger ran a hand down his arms and tutted. Still wearing the silver cufflinks. We haven't learned our lesson on the dangers of transition metals. Perhaps we've been hoping for a reprise. Repetition is also an excellent pedagogical method, nodded Granger. I await instruction, said Draco, an absurd amount of hope in his voice. Oh no, that too would require a practical demonstration. Oh? Unladylike. Inappropriate. Unwise. All the best things are. Granger gave him the most adorable, dangerous little smirk. Perhaps I'll show you when you show me the whipped cream. You are devious and cruel. 
Thank you. May I inquire about another minor secret while I have you? Yes. She had him in so many senses of the term. It was a bit ridiculous. What was the thing that you thought of buying for me, other than the appalling pajamas? The inappropriate thing? Draco teetered on the edge of the fulcrum. That was nothing, he said, instead of indicating that he had visited a lingerie shop in Muggle London and daydreamed about it for days. Nothing? I ought to push you into the stacks and tyrannize you into an answer. Yes, she had him. His heart, that stupid and useless organ, was full. Please do, said Draco. She put a single finger to his chest and backed him up. He hadn't far to go before he hit the stacks behind him, half a step at best. A shelf dug into his back. Her fingertip pushed lightly into his front. Could she feel his heart? Probably. Tell me, said Granger. Mm, no. Granger hooked a finger into his collar and rose to her toes. Tell me, she whispered against his jaw, or else. Just a few sweet nothings and sweet threatenings and barely there touching, and he was back in the spin of the vertigo. The gentle euphoria was upon him. He was love-struck, Granger-addled fool. Shan't, said Draco. What were they even talking about? It was her turn to put her fingers on his chin. She drew his face to her. Give us the barest of hints, then, she said, fluttering as she did, the barest of hints of her breath against his mouth. You are terribly insistent. I, too, get what I want. Is it still wants when the thing you want is so willing to give itself to you? asked Draco. Deep philosophies amongst the stacks, said Granger. Stop trying to distract me. You're the one distracting me, said Draco. Their noses touched. I haven't any idea what we're on about. Inappropriate presence. Right. What must I threaten you with? To disclose this information, asked Granger, searching his eyes, a smile in her voice. Draco put his forehead against hers. Withholding whatever you're teasing me with at the moment. A conundrum, she drew a finger along his jaw. Difficult to withhold when I so want to give. More philosophies to delight and intrigue. She breathed against his mouth for a moment longer. It was an exquisite exercise in self-control to not slide his hand around the back of her neck and pull her to him. Ranger drew away by an inch or two. I am withholding. Talk. Heartless, said Draco. Satisfy my curiosity and I'll satisfy these. These what? Philosophical inquiries. What a charming bit of bribery. Will it work? Ors are trained against that, aren't they? In principe. But my professional integrity crumbles before you. Yet again. Oh no, said Granger. You needn't look so smug. Tell me. I simply wanted to buy you. Less appalling nightwear. Thoughtful. Nothing too inappropriate about that. It was a muggle lingerie shop. Oh. Muggles are very imaginative with their nightwear, you know. Far more than our wizarding equivalents. So many strappy thingies. Lace garters. Camisoles. Lovely matching sets. Naughty little ensembles, all of which occupied my thoughts for far too long afterwards. There was a blush on Granger's cheeks. I told you it was inappropriate, said Draco. Dreadfully, said Granger. Come here so I can give you your bribe. Draco leaned down. She placed a kiss onto his lips and pulled away before he could respond in kind. It wasn't enough. None of this was enough. He wanted to kiss her slowly. He wanted to back her up into those stacks and lift her and squeeze all of his want into her. Should have negotiated parameters for this bribe's duration and intensity, mused Draco. Probably wiser this way, said Granger. Her gaze flitted back to his mouth. Then, with an effort, she looked away. She twisted idly at one of his cufflinks. Delicate fingertips brushed at his wrist. You didn't ask me where my favorite spot was on the estate, said Draco. Oh, well. Where is it? Here. It is a beautiful library. No. Here. With you. He caught her hand when she played with his cufflinks and entwined his fingers with hers. She smiled that smile that made him soar. She was a light amongst the shadows, doe-eyed, blush-cheeked, golden-souled. His heart was full of her. Her mind, her wit, her magic, her ambition, her beauty, her chaos. He felt himself at the edge of the fall. He could love her. Gods, he could love her. He ran a finger along her cheek. He might love her already. 
in secret heartbeats and stolen touches and slow looks. There was a tearing and a dissonance, a pleasurable pain, and his mind stretched to accept what his heart already knew. He loved her already. It tore. It suffered in silence. She, unaware of his ordeal, turned her face into his hand. Against his palm, the softness of her cheek, the press of her smile. He was so full of longing it hurt. He was wretched. I've missed you, said Draco, his voice caught at the edges. The horrible, heart-on-sleeve sincerity of it appalled him. She, bless her, responded in kind. I've missed you, too. There was a breathiness in the words, the unsteady, of the suppressed emotion. I feel as though I'm back in the world of the living. He held her close. He ran his thumb over her ring. You must tell me when you've recovered your capacity for complications. She looked up at him with lips parted and eyes the color of curiosity. He felt her returning touch against his knuckles. After today, I may have a spot of wiggle room. What if we were just a bit stupid then? Let's be stupid. She slipped her fingers under his braces where they lay against his shoulders and pulled him towards her. He backed her into the books. He kissed her slowly, as he had wanted to, and lifted her against the stacks, as he had wanted to, and squeezed all of his want into it. Her lips smiled against his. Her kiss was sweet, and gods, it felt like love. They snogged like idiot teenagers amongst the shadowy stacks. She was as beautiful as he imagined she would be, pressed against the books. Her hair came loose. He breathed her in by the lungful, by the heartful. Small fingers sought something to hold, slipped out his bicep, went to his shoulder, and then found his collar. There was such a loveliness in all of it, her mouth keeping pace with his slow kisses, the lightness of her in his arms, her gasp. It was a rapture, a magic. He wanted to tell her that she had him, that he was hers. He wanted her for his own. He loved her. He kissed this realization into her neck. It was lightheaded with it, sick with it, afloat with it. The dinner gong rang. After the stupidities, gorgeous, bright, shining stupidities, Draco found that there was love in everything he did. It was in the door he held open for her as they left the library. It was the brush of his shoulder against hers in the corridor, in his walking her to the dining room. There was a desperate love when he stood still for her to fix his collar. There was tender love when he pulled out her chair. There was aching love in pouring her a glass of wine. When he, like a fool, reached to push a curl of her hair behind her ear, it was wrecked with love. He teased her for her small bites because he loved her. He threatened to steal her last profiterole because he loved her. It was why he followed her into crypts, why he wrestled hinds in swamps, why he kissed her scar. And that pull, that gravitational force, was falling into love over and over again. At the foot of the stairs after dinner, there was a frightened love in his good night, pulling back on itself, trying to keep itself secret. His sleep well sounded like, come here and kiss me again. As she went up the stairs and he watched her ascend, her every step away from him was a heartache. He ran his hand through his hair and stared at the empty stairs. He loved her. It was in every embrace, in flights under the stars, in crossing of swords, in secret ballroom dances, in the giving of things, in the life savings, in the passing of handkerchiefs, in the accidental touchings, the arguing about hyphenated surnames, the drunken picnics, the shared cups of tea. He loved her. She made him understand the words.